when the lights went out over Northumberland and everyone was climbing into bed. That's when he got out of his grave. Bloated and pestiferous, this walking corpse stalked the land, banging on the doors of the men who buried him. He shouted, moaned. He slammed his fists. Alongside him were a pack of howling dogs, and he left a cloud of pestilence in his wake. Nobody knew how this man had come back, and no one had any idea who or what would bring him back like, like that. Though one thing was obvious, someone messed up big time. Thanks so much to Factor for keeping us well-fed fast. We owe the story we're about to tell to William of Newburgh, an English historian of the 12th century, who himself was told it by an old monk who saw it happen. The year, we think, is 1196, and a man whose name we do not know has fled the city of York, having committed some misdeeds so foul, or at the very least so irrelevant to the story, William didn't bother to write that part down. This man, who for our purposes will name, uh, Trevor, sought refuge in a place William called Anantis. Of course, there's nowhere in England called Anantis, but some think William was talking about Anak Castle in the county of Northumberland. Upon his arrival, Trevor was given refuge by the lord of the castle. So he settled in on the castle grounds, got a job, got married, didn't change his evil ways, things were great. Or they were, until the bad vibrations he put out into the world turned once again back toward him. One day, Trevor got word of a rumor that his new wife was unfaithful. Oh, obviously, he had to find out whether or not this was true, so he took the most direct approach possible. Oh dear, I shall be going on a mysterious trip, he told his wife, and I will not be back for several days. Oh, but he would be back. That night, in fact, hiding up in the rafters of his bedroom to spy on any of her extracurricular activities. And to his great despair, he learned the rumors were true. He watched her from above with some young man and seethed his wife in his home, in his bed. Oh, he had never been so humiliated. That is, of course, until he proceeded to fall out of the rafters. The young man bolted and Trevor's wife gave styling out a shot. Maybe she and Trevor could have been living in a cartoon world where a knock on the head caused instant amnesia. Oh, you're, you're back early, she said. Uh, uh, how, how was the trip, dear? <laughs> but no, he saw... And he knew. But he was also kind of sort of dying from the trauma of the fall. So a monk was called, the one who would later relay this whole affair to William. And he ministered to Trevor on his deathbed. We all know about your misdeeds in York, he said. You must confess those sins and receive the Eucharist. Trevor, no man of piety, said he couldn't promise, of course. But he'd give it a good long think. Then he died. But that's not where the story ends. Trevor, body black and blue from the fall corpse swollen and flushed with blood, was buried in a shallow grave. But then something, maybe even someone, brought him back. Crusted eyes flicked open, bloated arms burrowed through the soil, and out came Trevor. Or what was left of him? A walking dead. A revenant. A trevenant? And he was about to give the whole world a reason to start burying its dead six feet under. Now, you might be asking yourself at this point in the story, how the heck did this happen? What makes a revenant? What force in this world is strong enough to shock dead flesh back to life? The power of pure rage, perhaps? Seething hate? The yearning of business left unfinished on Earth? Or was Trevor being punished for a lifetime of sin and rejecting the Eucharist? Well, you are in luck, because William of Newburgh had the answer. Satan did it. Yep. Why, he didn't say, but make no mistake, it was definitely Satan, maybe to, you know, uh, raise hell on Earth, maybe just for a laugh. Oh, but the people of Onyx Castle were not laughing. Because that night, and every night thereafter, Trevor the Revenant sprouted from his grave with a pack of rowdy dogs yapping at his distended heels. He lurched around the castle grounds, the stench of rotting flesh cutting the night air. And if one of these nights you happened to be out of the house and he found you, oh, God help you because the rumor was that he would beat you up. And then stop there, apparently. Yeah, here's the thing about a revenant that sort of distinguishes it from other forms of undead. It doesn't eat brains, it doesn't suck blood. Kinda seems like the worst thing it'll do is going around punching people. Ooh, maybe giving them like a good dead arm or something. Then it gets back into its grave and has a sleep. Of course, nobody back then knew much about revenants. Not why they existed, Satan. Not what they wanted, or how to stop them. Oh, don't get me wrong though, they'd heard of revenants. Trevor most certainly wasn't the first. There were stories. 
a dead guy showing up at dinner, even though he wasn't invited, another man who rose from his grave only to belly flop onto his sleeping wife. But what are you supposed to take from stories like that? What motive can you infer? And more importantly, what weakness? Though, as it happened, motives weren't exactly the problem in this case. Sure, if you're taking out the trash one night and a naked tumescent corpse smacks you in the back of the head, that's totally not okay. But worse than the Trevenant's general loudishness was the disease it spread. Death wafted off his rotting, shambling flesh. It wasn't safe to breathe around him. Whole households were struck ill, some even died from the sickness, while others, in fear, packed up and fled. Yeah, Trevor had to go. Oh, but how? Still believing the problem, and thus the solution, was religious in nature. The monk called in some of his most learned colleagues for a consultation. Okay, well, the curious case of the dogs chasing the revenant in the nighttime posed some fascinating theological questions, to be sure. Perhaps various incantations or scripture readings could weaken the beast. But while those very heady discussions were underway, with the wisest religious minds in England gearing up to divine this monster's weakness, a new theory was fast gaining support in the castle. Why don't we just set him on fire? I mean, really, wouldn't that work on just about anything? It certainly wouldn't hurt. Them, that is, it would most definitely hurt Trevor a lot. So, as the monks debated, two men, brothers, whose father had perished by the revenant's stink, grabbed shovels and headed for the cemetery. It was quick work to disinter the body beneath a thin bedsheet of dirt. There he was, an awful vision of post-humanity, a body swollen like a bloody bladder. The brothers were struck speechless, as if this was the first time they'd actually laid eyes upon the creature. And maybe it was? They had to wonder, had anyone really gotten a good look at this revenant? I mean, what had actually happened in the days since his death, besides some dogs barking at night and people in the Middle Ages dying from illnesses? Did the dead really walk among them? Had anyone they'd known actually been beaten up a little by a dead guy? Oh man, was there ever such a thing as a revenant at all? Oh, this really made him stop and think for a moment. Hmm. Ah, well, better safe than sorry. The brothers wailed on the corpse with shovels until the hole in the ground flowed over with old blood. Then they yanked out Trevor's heart, because again, couldn't hurt, and set the body alight. And on the pyre it burned, just like all bodies will. For these same reasons that killing a shark by shooting it out of a cannon at the moon will work. Overkill. And after that, for the first night in a long while, Onik Castle knew peace, and so at last did Trevor. And thus ends the story of our revenant, if he ever even existed. Was he just a boogeyman invented to explain away the most recent series of Middle Ages epidemics? Maybe. But if he was real, and such creatures walk the earth, and if you were ever unfortunate enough to see one lurching up the road one night, dogs and pestilence behind them, what would you do? Well, friends, if you take anything away from the story of Trevor the Revenant, let it be this. Don't overthink it, okay? Wear a mask, wash your hands, and hit the thing with a frickin' car. Ooh, and you know something else I enjoy not overthinking is lunch and dinner. And now thanks to Factor, I never have to. Now, if you've been watching this channel for a while, you know I've talked about meal delivery services like HelloFresh, which I do love because I really do enjoy cooking when I have the time, which is not often these days. So what am I supposed to do, right? I can't just have frozen meals all the time because there's just too many preservatives and they always kind of taste like Garbo. And then my bank account can't really handle more than a few takeout orders a month. So my solution honestly has been Factor, which is this amazing pre-prepared meal delivery service that takes the guesswork out of my breakfast, lunch, and dinner that all of my friends are just very sick of me telling them about. Every meal is ready in around two minutes and there is zero prep, zero mess, just good dang food. Also, Factor really does give you a ton of meal options to choose from and you can basically use it to achieve almost any nutritional goal you may have. They got everything from keto, calorie smart, protein plus, veggie, vegan options, and more, all of which you can choose from in their tastacular rotating weekly menus. I do mine at the start of every week. I get excited about it. Yes, I am that guy. And I am quite glad I stocked up this week because we relaunched Extra Mythology, and that's been keeping me a tad busier than usual. So rather than eating something bad for me or skipping lunch altogether to get work done, instead I'm having fusilli and ground pork tomato ragu, which, hi, I was planning on eating right after I did this read, but just smelled so dang good. I figured I'm going to eat it while I do the read. Here we go. Yeah, mm-hmm. This is what I needed in my life. So if you'd like to eat better while also being better with your time, 
Really, all you gotta do is head over to factor75.com slash extra credits 50, and then use the code extra credits 50 to get 50% off your first factor box. And when you do, not only will you be getting fast, tasty meals that fit your lifestyle and be helping out this channel in the process, but you'll also be joining the myriad of my personal friends who I've suggested to jump on this factor train, and they seem to be liking it as well. We are legion now. Oh, and don't sleep on their smoothies either. Did I mention they have smoothies? They have pretty dang good smoothies. You can't have this one as mine. Again, that is code extra credits 50 to get 50% off your first box at factor75.com slash extra credits 50. Seriously, I've been really enjoying these and I do not think you're going to be disappointed. Say, did you ever hear the one about Skylar Holmes, Kuya Koi, Joseph Blame, Dominic Valenciana, Casey Mustia, Arcolite Games, Angela Valenciana, and Ahmad Ziad Turk being fantastic legendary patrons? Because I sure did. <laughs>